morning. My name is Madison Latham, and I serve in the children's ministry. Today, I'll be reading 1 Corinthians 1.10. I appeal to you, brothers, by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that all of you agree, and that there be no divisions among you, but that you be united in the same mind and the same judgment. This is the word of the Lord. Man, I don't know if you heard what she just read, uh, but this is what the Apostle Paul wrote to the church at Corinth uh, the church that I told you had a lot of issues, had a lot of things going on. I'm going to read it to you one more time in verse 10. He says, I appeal to you, brothers, by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that all of you agree, and that there be no divisions among you, but that you be united in the same mind and the same judgment. I got to go and spend a little bit of time in Hocha Town with my family this, this weekend. Uh, there are five of us, and the idea that we would all agree about anything, about uh, where we're going to eat and what we're going to do, about who gets to sleep where, about how late we stay up. Like, there is not a lot of agreement, and we're a family, right? I, I mean, I'm raising these kids. I married my wife, and there's not a tremendous amount of agreement, right? It's difficult, and we have to fight to have any sort of unity, even within our family. And so as the Apostle Paul is writing to the church at Corinth, which I told you, they had issues because Corinth was a crazy place. I mean, it was primarily comprised of formerly freed or freed slaves, former slaves or freed slaves and travelers and people from all sorts of ethnic and religious backgrounds. The city was full of idolatry and immorality and in comes the gospel. And people begin to be saved as the Apostle Paul preaches and teaches and, and, and the church is born and he's teaching them for 18 months. This is how you follow Jesus. And I told you last week that they had living church issues because as the church in Corinth continued to live out the mandate to make disciples, they would go out into that city. New believers would come to faith in Jesus Christ, be brought into the church, and it created all sorts of divisions and issues. And the Apostle Paul, throughout this letter, is going to be reminding them that what they lived in their culture, what they saw every single day, that you know uh, how the culture solved problems and worked through things, um, that that was not our normal. It's not how the church of Jesus Christ responds. That We can't take our cues from the people outside the church, but instead we look to Christ and we look to his word to see how we're supposed to live. And so the Apostle Paul gets to confront a rather unique issue. Now, not unique in the, in the substance. Uh, division in churches is pretty common. Um, it's It's completely common, right? Any church I've ever been in, there's division. Uh, it's the type of division that's going on in, in, in the church at Corinth at this point that's, that's rather unique. Now, I, if anyone here grow up old school kind of Baptist, you know what I'm talking about? Like old school Baptist where you got a business meeting, there will be rumbles in the business meetings, right? Uh, I, I was a part of a church um, Years ago, I got to serve on staff, my first experience, and uh, we had kind of the old school Baptist church set up. And I don't know if you know what that looks like, uh, but you need to have like a peaked roof of some sort, you know, uh, and then you had a stage, usually burgundy carpet, and you could get the green stuff, you know. Um, and on this side, over here, you had a piano, in the middle you had the baptistry, and on this side, if you were legit, you had the organ. Well, in, in this particular church I was serving in, our organ player had gotten ill, and she wasn't able to play anymore. And so we committed the sins. We messed with the Holy Trinity of the old school Baptist stage. We decided that we were going to move the organ out in favor of an instrument that we actually had someone that could play. And we had a throw down in a business meeting. I mean, people got mad and they left. They were upset. Like it was a huge ordeal um, because we moved an instrument that nobody in the church could currently play. And I don't know what your story about division looks like, but maybe for you, you've been hurt in the church. And maybe it wasn't about an organ or the color of the carpet. Maybe it was just a simple conflict with another believer. Maybe it was over politics. Maybe it was over your views on sports. I mean, there's any number of things that could divide us as believers in Jesus Christ. I mean, any number of things. And if you've been in church very long, you've likely been hurt by somebody else somebody who disagrees with you and someone who decided to take their preferences and make them foremost or someone that took their opinion and tried to beat it down your throat, right? 
So conflict and division, it happens in the church. And the Apostle Paul is writing to this church that had all sorts of issues. He's telling them, I want you to be united. I want you to agree. I want you to have the same mind and have the same judgment. So today, I want to talk to you about how a diverse church can live together in unity. Now, a, a little more background on the church at Corinth. Uh, status was a big deal. Kind of the Greek ideas of wisdom, um, that was a big thing they all pursued. They would love to sit around and listen to uh, kind of the, the philosophers of their day. And they would share kind of their ideas and theories about how the world worked and how we should live and metaphysics and all sorts of stuff. The Greeks loved it. They couldn't get enough of philosophy and rhetoric. And so if you wanted to be an influencer in Corinth or the wider Greek culture, uh, you needed two, two things. You needed to be solid in philosophy, some overarching philosophy that you could speak about and teach on, uh, but you also had to be eloquent. You had to be trained in rhetoric and how to deliver that. And if you could do that, and the Greeks thought you were awesome. As a matter of fact, your social status among Greek culture would oftentimes be measured by which philosopher, what person you would align yourself with, and what philosophy that you would kind of trumpet. And among the Greeks, it wasn't as if you just sat around and you're like, you know, you got your opinion, I got mine, I follow this guy, you follow that guy. But instead, it would be open debate, like open in the, in the marketplace or the agora in the culture or wherever they would be, uh, they would be talking about these ideas and these philosophers and these various ways of approaching life, and they would debate each other openly. And who you aligned yourself with kind of suggested your standing. I actually uh, thought about this, and it happens a little bit in our culture too. If you want to know how maybe your status was gained or lost based upon who you aligned yourself with or the ideas that you uh, believed, I actually thought, you know, we should do a little experiment. And so I decided that we were going to give you guys um, shirts to wear for the next three days, which is kind of a nice gift, right? If we were to give you something, um, the only um, catch is that you have to wear the shirt that we pick out for you. Okay, so the shirts are all the same, same fit, same cut, same color, uh, but they're going to have three different pictures on them, right? And so all you have to do is wear them and not cover them up, right? So shirt number one, this is the face that's going to be on the front of that shirt, all right? So no big deal. You don't have to trumpet uh, the bl trumpet. That was a great word. Anyway, you don't have to uh, put forward any beliefs. You don't have to say the name. You just have to wear the shirt. But I'm guessing by virtue of wearing that shirt in our culture, some people would perceive and receive you differently. With some people, you might gain status, and other people, you might lose it, but simply by virtue of the shirt that you wore, right? The person that you aligned yourself with. Now, I, I think that would be kind of boring, uh, because you might already know how it would go if, if he was on your shirt. And so I think we need to do at least two days. The, the second person would be this. So this is your Tuesday shirt. I'm guessing that the reception uh, that you would receive by people walking down the street in your workplace, maybe even your own home, would be different based upon the person that you were representing. And, it, and if those guys weren't contentious enough, uh, we've got your Wednesday shirt here. The third one, Dr. Fauci, right? By virtue of the fact of who you align yourself with, the ideas you tr choose to trumpet, um, your status in Corinth would vary. Now, I use very divisive figures in our culture. You know, the people have divided over these. They're kind of hot-button people. But you can see that this was a valuable thing within Corinth. Like, they cared about who they aligned themselves with, and it had spilled over into the church. And this same kind of jockeying for position, you know, I follow this guy, you follow that guy, I'm better than you because this philosophy is better. Um, a similar thing had happened in the church. And there was so much infighting that a group of people had actually gone out from the church at Corinth, traveled to Ephesus to tell Paul, like, hey, things are so bad. It's falling apart for us. Like, we, we need you to address this division that's happening in the church. And so they left Chloe's household. They traveled to Ephesus. They tattled, in a sense. They'd, they'd gone and told Paul, here's what's going on. Could you write a letter and to help us to, to go from this, these growing divisions, which, I mean, they're likely to cause the church to fracture or even to, to be split, would you address this? And so Paul does the simple thing right on the front end. He's like, hey, verse 10, I appeal to you, brothers, by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, 
that all of you agree. That there be no divisions among you, but that you be united in the same mind and the same judgment. It has been reported to me, he, he told who had told him, by Chloe's people that there is quarreling among you, my brothers. And here's what I mean, because he knew the story. He knew what they were fighting about. What I mean is that each one of you says, I follow Paul, or I follow Apollos, or I follow Cephas. That's Peter, by the way, the apostle Peter. Or I follow Christ. Now, it seems crazy that these Corinthians, who live so close to the time of Jesus who would have been able to speak with eyewitnesses to the resurrection of Christ. It seems crazy to me that they would come inside the church, and because it was kind of standard in your culture to align yourself with a person or a specific philosophy or ideas, they would come in the church and do the same things to the extent that the church is so fractured and so divided that somebody has to go tell Paul and say, hey, we need your help. Now, To align with Paul at Corinth, it made a little bit of sense. Because after all, Paul was the first person ever to preach the gospel in Corinth. Many of the people who would have been in the church there, they would have known Paul on a first name basis. Maybe they came to faith under his preaching and he taught them during that 18 month period. Maybe they'd seen the Apostle Paul work a miracle of healing in their family or their own life. And so, you know, you could see a little bit of loyalty there. But this went far beyond that. This was, no, 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 I follow Paul. Somehow I'm better than you are. I'm elevating myself above you because I follow Paul. I'm associating myself with him. And you're just one of those followers of Apollos. Now, the thing about Paul, he was an apostle. He was rock solid theologically. But if you read much of the scripture, uh, you know that the apostle Paul had a tendency to be a little bit lengthy at times in his preaching. And whereas the Greeks loved eloquent speakers who could deliver wisdom with wise and persuasive words, the Apostle Paul just didn't do that. As a matter of fact, it's in Acts chapter 20. You have the account of Paul preaching so long, right? This is you're going to be late for lunch sorts of sermons. He preached until midnight. And there was a young man named Eutychus who was sitting in a third floor window. And Paul went so long, was so boring apparently, that Eutychus fell asleep and fell out of the third floor window and died. The Apostle Paul's like, well, I guess I've got to wrap this one up now. I've got to go, you know, raise a guy from the dead. And that was the, the end of the sermon. So maybe people in the church love Paul because maybe he led some to faith. But others were like, gosh, he's dry you know, God preaches forever. Why in the world would you follow him? So then you have Apollos. Apollos was the opposite of Paul. Apollos, you read Acts chapter 18, was an eloquent speaker. So if Apollos had stood on this stage and preached on this day, you would have left here thinking, oh my gosh, like he's such a great speaker. He was engaging. He had me laughing when it was time to laugh and crying when it was time to cry like Apollos. It feels like the Spirit has just fallen on all of us. Like Jesus was there. I mean, he just worked in such an amazing way. Like Apollos is the preacher. And so maybe if you were a Greek who loved eloquent rhetoric and wise, maybe Apollos was your guy. But Apollos had issues too. As a matter of fact, early on in this ministry, Apollos had been preaching the gospel and had to be taken aside by Priscilla and Aquila and further taught the truth of the gospel. His theological understanding was a bit incomplete at times. And so maybe you weren't a Paul guy and you weren't an Apollos guy. Maybe you just followed Peter. You know, Peter was one of the 12 apostles who walked and talked with Jesus. And he didn't just walk and talk with Jesus. He even walked on water for a bit above all the other apostles, right, before he sank. But he got a few steps in. Um, Peter was the guy who preached on the day of Pentecost when the Holy Spirit was given to the world, to those who had professed faith in Christ, and thousands were saved in a day. I mean, Peter's kind of big time, right? I mean, he'd, he'd performed miracles. He'd underwent an extraordinary amount of persecution. So maybe you were a Paul guy or an Apollos guy or a Peter guy. And for whatever reason, as foolish as that sounds, that became a very divisive issue in the church at Corinth. They were jockeying for position, for status, for power within the church. 
And they were using these men to bolster their own status. Paul says, what I mean is that each one of you says, I follow Paul or Apollos or Cephas or I follow Christ. And Paul just begins to ask them some questions that I think help us understand what it looks like as a diverse body to walk in unity rather than the divisions that could easily pop up. The first thing that I want you to see here is that Paul would call them to magnify Christ alone. If we are going to be a church, if they were going to be a church, a diverse church that walked together in unity, the first thing he would point them to is that you should magnify Jesus Christ alone. And so just to maybe give them some perspective on the situation, the things that were dividing them, he asked the question, Verse 13, he says, is Christ divided? Was was Paul crucified for you? Did he die on the cross? What about Apollos? No. Peter? No. Were you baptized in the name of Apollos? Or Peter? Or Paul? And the answer is resounding no. And what Paul is doing is he's putting into perspective the one person who is worthy of their devotion, of their affection, of their worship. And it wasn't any of the men that they were trumpeting their names. There was one who was worthy of their worship. And that was Jesus Christ alone. Jesus alone created all that we know and see by his own words. Everything in this world was created by Jesus and for Jesus. Jesus alone was the only begotten Son of the Father. Jesus alone had taken on flesh and made his dwelling among the world. Jesus alone had lived the perfect, sinless life. In the midst of this broken world, he lived a perfect, sinless life. And Jesus alone had offered himself on the cross for the sins of the world. It was Jesus alone who died on that cross and spent three days in the grave before he rose from the dead. It is Jesus alone who, when he was resurrected, ascended into heaven and sat down at the right hand of the Father. It is Jesus alone who will return to judge the living and the dead. It is at the name of Jesus that one day every knee shall bow and every tongue will confess. It is at the name of Jesus Christ alone. Now, as foolish as it sounds, the people would argue, well, I was baptized by Paul. I must be more special than you are. And I was baptized by Peter. I responded to his preaching. As, as foolish as that sounds, we in the church today, if we're not extremely careful, can allow something secondary to take the place of Jesus Christ. Something secondary, something that's far inferior to Christ something that didn't save us, something that we can never hope in, someone that didn't die for us, whatever it might be, we can allow something that is so secondary, that does not compare to Jesus Christ to become primary. And when we let secondary things become primary in the church, division will be rampant. Maybe it's your preferences or your opinions. Maybe it's your political party. It's the person running for president or any other office. And rather than saying, the spotlight of my life, the person whom I'm going to magnify and make much of in my life is Jesus Christ and Him alone, when we take the spotlight off of Jesus and place it on anyone or any other thing, division will result. So Paul's like, how... He's not naive, by the way, when he calls them to be united of the same mind and have the same judgment. He's telling them, if you're going to be a diverse church that remains unified, then the spotlight has to stay on Jesus. We magnify Christ alone. 
And this isn't something that we just kind of get to halfway practice. There are things that are going to compete for our affections and devotion in this life. We are going to be tempted, just like they were, to trust in something or someone other than Jesus, to put our hope and our faith in that and believe that if this world's going to go in the right direction, this thing has to take place. This person has to get elected. This opinion has to be embraced. And yet if we're going to remain united... We magnify, we, as the church of Jesus Christ, we magnify Christ alone. The story of our lives is not hope in a party. It's not in a person. It's not in an opinion or a perspective or a preference. Our hope rests in Jesus Christ alone. He is the one that we magnify. When we talk to people in the world, they should never think about us and think, you know what? And that guy, he's a really... He's a really strong conservative. I think he really hopes and believes that if we could just elevate capitalism or free enterprise or any of the marks of what you might believe, then the world would be somehow saved in a better place. Or, or, or I mean, I talked to her, and gosh, she's, she's just a, a very liberal person, and her hope is that if we could you know, just progress as a nation and embrace these things, and somehow that would be our hope. People should never mistake what we truly hope in, what we trust in, what we magnify with our lives. And it's not our politics or our preferences or our opinions. It's Jesus Christ alone. Paul goes on here after asking the questions, was Paul crucified for you? Were you baptized in the name of Paul? He you're going to see something interesting. Um, we believe that scriptures were inspired by the Holy Spirit, but worked through the personalities of men. And so the apostle Paul uh, likely didn't personally write all of his letters, but rather he would dictate them to someone, a scribe or someone who was more skilled. And so the Apostle Paul, you can tell this is an emotional moment for him. Somehow they have, they have let other people take the place of Christ. And he's, he's a little bit fired up, but he's dictating this letter. And so you can almost see him sitting somewhere in Ephesus and he's firing off this letter to encourage the church to make much of Christ and not other people. And so in, in verse 14, he says, I thank God that I baptized none of you. And so you can almost picture, you know, the, the scribe, and he's writing that out. And then Paul's like, ooh, ooh remembered, except uh, Crispus and, and Gaius. I forgot to baptize those guys. It's been a few years since I was uh, back at Corinth. He says, so that none of you may say that you were baptized in my name. People that would boast in something other than Christ, I'm so thankful I didn't baptize any of you, except Crispus and Gaius. And then there's another little insert that the scribe has to write out for him. I also baptized the household of Stephanus. Beyond that, I don't even remember whether I baptized anyone else. The point is, is that Paul is nothing and that Jesus is everything. You have this funny little aside as he it probably got a little bit fired up and he wants to communicate this truth. And he, he doesn't even remember who he baptized because, because he knew that that meant nothing. And that Jesus is the one who meant everything. For Christ did not send me to baptize. He didn't send me to make much of myself. That men might make much of him. He sent me to preach the gospel. Not with eloquent words of wisdom that the Greeks would desire. Not with words of eloquent wisdom. Lest the cross of Christ be emptied of its power. There are things in our lives especially as free Americans where we get to vote, where we can publicly advocate our opinions, there is a tendency for us to allow things to take the place of Jesus, to take the spotlight of our lives and to place it on something or someone else. And the result of that is that the cross of Jesus Christ is emptied of its power. We give people a false hope and a false Savior. Anytime we point them to anyone or anything other than Jesus, we give them something that is powerless, that can never change, that can never transform them. Paul's like, you want to know why? Maybe I preach a little long. Why I don't demonstrate the wisdom to the Greeks and the rhetoric that he was already trained in. Because I want all the focus to be on Jesus. And I don't want it to be my great communication abilities. I don't want it to be my charisma, my gifts, my talents. I want the focus to be on Jesus. So how do we, a diverse church, remain united in Christ Jesus? We magnify Christ alone. 
You know, there are people here that have more visible gifts than others. Some people serve behind the scenes and you don't even know what they've been doing. Some people that are super wise in the word and other people who just have a servant's heart that you wouldn't believe. And what we don't do is focus on ourselves or begin to believe in our strengths or our gifts or our abilities. We don't trust in charisma, great leadership ability, eloquent speech. We trust in the cross of Jesus Christ. We magnify him alone. Point number two here. How does a diverse church walk together in unity? We magnify Christ alone. Number two, we are bound together by the power of the cross. Look in verse 18. He says, For the word of the cross is folly to those who are perishing. Y'all, we trumpet that God became a human, was born of a virgin, he lived a sinless life here on this earth. And he was crucified on a Roman cross for the sins of the world. He died there and rose again three days later from the dead. And is now ruling and reigning in heaven. And outside of people of faith, go, go read on the internet. I mean, that whole concept of the gospel, it gets mocked and scorned. You believe in a guy 2,000 years ago rose from the dead? You believe that God was born of a virgin? You believe the Bible literally? And yet the one thing that we all have in common as the church of Jesus Christ, and this is us, this is the church that has existed in every place at every time, our resounding answer is yes. Yes. And not only do we believe that, but that is our hope. That is the hope to which we cling. We believe that that is the power of God that has saved us. That Jesus took our sin, not on the basis of our goodness, not on the basis of our works, not because we tried hard enough, not because we were smart enough or talented enough or would live well enough for God, but on the basis of our faith in Jesus Christ alone. Jesus goes to the cross. He takes our sin upon himself. He bears the just punishment for our sin and credits to us his righteousness. That is the gospel. That is the hope that we have for those of us who are being saved. Man, it's crystal clear for us. We believe the gospel. We're staking our lives and our futures on it. But to the rest of the world, it looks like foolishness. There is this trend among American Christianity to try to make it look better than it is. Man, there's some parts of the Bible that are rather offensive, and so we maybe we'll downplay those a little bit. Or maybe we'll just ignore them altogether. And maybe if we'll just present a little bit nicer version of Jesus, which there doesn't exist, by the way, if we'll present a little more palatable version of the gospel, maybe more people will believe. And what Paul is telling the people at Corinth is, listen, you're not going to make it more palatable. You're not, you're not going to make this thing you know, simpler or, or where people are suddenly going to be like, oh, yes, I totally get it. That makes perfect logical sense. You'll never have a gospel where faith isn't required. But for those of us who are in Christ, we are united at the foot of the cross. We've come to believe that Jesus is the Savior of the world, that God took on flesh and made his dwelling among us. And then he died on the cross to bear the punishment that we deserved. And we come to him not on the basis of our goodness, but by faith in him alone and believe that we are saved by the blood of Jesus Christ. And when we come by faith alone, there's not a lot of room for boasting. There's not a lot of room for elevating ourselves. We're reminded that though the only thing we brought to the table in our relationship with Jesus was sin, and our sin was met with his blood, with his grace, with his forgiveness, the cross humbles us. And you know how we then treat other people who might sin against us or disagree with us or have a preference or opinion that's different from us? We do to them what Jesus did for us. We lay down our lives for them. We give up our preferences 
our opinions and our perspectives. And in love, we treat others as if they're more important than we are. That's what Jesus did for us. The ground is level at the foot of the cross. And it is the cross of Jesus Christ that binds us together, the church. And so we treat people as Jesus has treated us, with love and grace and respect, even in the midst of some disagreements. Now, I, I mentioned this before, but I don't think Paul was naive when he just said, hey, I want all of you to agree. What he was talking about when he called the church to unity, it wasn't uniformity. He knew that. I mean, he's going to go on and talk about the difference in Jews and Gentiles, the Greeks and the Jews. He's going to talk about, you know, the various perspectives they had, the diversity of gifts that they had, the talents. and abilities. Paul was not, he had no illusions that unity in the church was uniformity. He knew they were going to have various perspectives. But he wanted them to be united in Christ, bound together by the cross. So we let go of the things that are lesser, and we cling to that which is greater. That's Jesus Christ and the gospel of hope that we have. Unity isn't uniformity. It's also not false harmony. The way that we exist together in unity in the church is not by pretending. Y'all know how the people in the South do this, right? Someone comes to you, and they're going to trump in an opinion or perspective that you think is absolute garbage. You're like, that is the most ridiculous thing I have ever heard, right? Like, and what we do in the South is we, we oftentimes fake harmony. You, you sit there, and you enthusiastically smile and shake your head, and then they walk off, and you think, Bless his ever loving heart. He has no idea what he's talking about. Like, have you, I mean, do you even pay attention to the world or whatever it might be, right? And we kind of fake it. We pretend that everything's okay. Y'all ever met a couple that's like this? If ever I have a couple come into my office and they're like, yeah, we've never had a fight, I'm like, y'all are liars. I mean, there's no way. That's not true. We don't fake harmony in the church, but instead we remember the cross of Jesus Christ. We remember the gospel that unites us. And even when people do have perspectives and act in ways that are frustrating, maybe they even hurt us. We forgive one another just as Jesus forgave us. We extend love and grace as Jesus has extended love and grace to us. So we are, we, uh, in order to be a diverse church that walks together in unity, we magnify Christ alone. We are bound together by the power of the cross. And the final piece is that we walk in His strength for His glory. This isn't always easy. It's not easy in marriage. It's not easy in parenting, even on vacation at Hoach Town with your family. It's not easy, and it's not easy in the church. But we walk in the strength of Jesus Christ, and we do so for his glory. Paul again asks them some questions. He says, Where is the one who is wise? Where is the scribe or the debater of this age? Has, God, has not God made foolish the wisdom of the world? And there's no theory or philosophy out there that saves us. Bring in the great debaters, right? The, the great philosophers. None of them has the wisdom to save us. For since in the wisdom of God, the world did not know God through wisdom. It wasn't through these philosophies or these philosophers. It pleased God through the folly of what we preach to save those who believe. For Jews demanded signs and the Greeks wanted wisdom. But we preach Christ crucified, a stumbling block to Jews and folly to the Gentiles. But to those who are called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ is the power of God and the wisdom of God. And the foolishness of God is wiser than men. And the weakness of God is stronger than men. Bring me your best philosophy, and it won't save you. Bring me your most knowledgeable, the smartest of men, and they can't change a heart. But what has transformed every one of our lives is the gospel of Jesus Christ. And yet, at times, we'll have a tendency to lean on opinions and perspectives or knowledge, believing those to be the best things and the, the, the hope, like, we've got to go this way. When in reality, the wisdom of men, the best thought we could ever come up with, pales in comparison to the least thought that God would have. The, least, the most amount of power we could muster up doesn't compare to the least of the power of God. And he says to him, verse 26, For consider your calling, brothers. Not many of you were wise according to worldly standards. Not many of you were powerful. Not many were of noble birth. 
He's being gentle right here. He's going to say the rest of it here in the next statement. He's like, I mean, how many of you guys saved yourselves? How many of you guys had, you know, just brilliant wisdom and status in society? God didn't choose you because of those things. And God chose you because of His grace. He goes on, he says, But God chose what is foolish in the world to shame the wise. Not only are you not wise, you were foolish. He chose what is weak in the world. Not only were you not strong, we were weak, right? He chose what is weak in the world to shame the strong. God chose what is low and despised in the world, even things that are not, to bring to nothing the things that are. So that no human being may boast in the presence of God. And because of him, you are in Christ Jesus, who became to us. Here's the beauty of this. When we will magnify Christ and be united in his cross, we gain something far greater than anything we would give up by you know, defaulting to opinions or perspectives or trusting in political leaders or any other thing. Jesus Christ became to us wisdom from God, righteousness and sanctification and redemption, so that as it is written, let the one who boasts boast in the Lord. The church of Jesus Christ, there's, there's no making much of men. There's no making much of ourselves. There's no jockeying for positions of power in the church, believing that we have the wisdom and the, and the way. But rather, when we magnify Christ and we're united under the cross, when we choose to use our strengths and abilities that God has given, it's His wisdom, it's His righteousness, His sanctification, we do so ultimately for His glory. We gain so much more in Christ than what we could ever give up. Y'all, our hope isn't in a philosophy. It's not in eloquent rhetoric. It's not in a party. It's not in an economic system. It's not in the Fed. It's not in Fauci. It's not in any other thing. Our hope is in Jesus Christ. And what the Apostle Paul would write to us, I believe, today is the same thing he wrote to them when it comes down to wisdom. Agree among yourselves. There should be no divisions among us. But we should be in the same mind and the same judgment. In a world that says, hey, uh, live your own truth, be your own truth, there is no truth, whatever. Um, the Apostle Paul says, no, no, no. You need to have the same mind. You need to think the same way. You need to be of the same judgment. It's not don't pass any judgment. You need to be of the same mind, the same judgment. And that ultimately is found in Christ, in his wisdom, in his word, led by his spirit to be united. Division comes when we forget whose strength we walk in and whose glory we're seeking. It happens to me sometimes. I begin to think that I'm the way, and I know the truth. I know where life is found. But that glory belongs to Christ alone. Would you bow with me? Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you for a church that is largely united. Father, we're not perfect. But we have a church full of men and women who are willing to give up their preferences and their opinions and their perspectives and to submit those to you. Because what we recognize, God, is that you are the one who is glorified over all. You alone are worthy of glory, honor, and praise, our worship, affections, and devotion. Lord, for those in this room that might hear the simple gospel message, the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ, and maybe for years it's been foolishness to them. Today I pray that it would become the power that transforms and the power that saves them. Lord, we hope in that simple gospel message, not in ourselves and not in our presentation. Lord, may you continue your work in our midst, using us as your church for your glory. We pray it in Jesus' name. Amen.